The, the premier game every year that we'd watch would be the Cleveland Browns and the New York Giants. And, you know, was that, was that kind of the game, the game of the year for you, kind of year in and year out? Playing the Giants? Yeah. Well, <laughs> you might say they, they were the, they, they were equal to the top of the teams we played, like we played with uh, San Francisco, we played the Lions. The Lions always gave us a headache. And, we, we always had some good, tough football games. Yeah. Uh, New York was, was always uh, right in there fighting us for uh, the top spot in the league. We used to, we used to have some tough games. Sam Huff. Is he a tough guy? He's tougher. Was he sort of. He didn't get the recognition that uh, he wasn't a good one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Sam was very good. He was one of the best players in that day. You lived in Berea, Ohio. I often wonder that myself. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about your mom and dad. My mom and dad, uh, they're uh, both from Hungary. Uh, they came to this country and had uh, worked in a coal mine for a while and worked in a steel mill. And he had his own business. He had a tavern. And, uh, and then he had four children, four boys. I had a brother who was an All-American basketball player, Kentucky. That's Alex. Yes, and uh, I had two older brothers who played uh, football, basketball, baseball in high school, and uh, they could have uh, done well in their particular day if, if the war hadn't interfered with their development. Yeah. So I came along and uh, I lucked out. Oh, that's, that's terrific. Now, your dad had a, um, he ran what, a, more or less a restaurant, pool hall type arrangement? Oh, it, well, you know, it's, he grew up a uh, half block from the steel mill. Uh, we lived upstairs over the restaurant. It was, a, it was more of a tavern type of thing because men would come in and have a sandwich and uh, have a beer, a shot of beer, you know, have to work and go home. Yeah. Now, is that where, is that where you worked there when you were a kid? Did you work for the regular well, I couldn't work in there because of my age. You know, I was, when, I, when I was getting get old enough to work there, I was going to college. Is that right? Where was college? Ohio State. I went there in 1942. I graduated in high school. Finished two quarters of my freshman year. We played three freshman football games. We couldn't play varsity football in those days. Mm -hmm. And I might back it up a little bit and say that when we were in high school, I was fortunate enough to be on a uh, state basketball championship team that made all high center of basketball and all high tackle football. We were state football champions also. And we were district champions in baseball. So we had some fine athletic teams when I was in high school and we sort of set the stage for what was to come. Yeah. And I, uh, I, I think I'm kind of fortunate and lucky to have had the experience and the development that I had when I was a kid. Yep. Did you, uh, now, what did you, when was the when did you enter uh, matriculate into Ohio State? 1942. I graduated high school in 42, and uh, I went to Ohio State. Finished two quarters of my freshman year. Played. We couldn't play varsity football in those days. And I played three freshman games, and in the military. And then it was in the invasion of the Philippines and Okinawa was the 96th division. I was a surgical technician in the mm -hmm. medical battalion. We took we the first medical installation and brought the wounded back to. So I probably saw a ward its worst. Uh, oh, yeah. Because we saw a lot of mangled bodies and had to attend to them with the doctors. We worked right with the doctors there. So you sort of like in a mash unit. Well, well <laughs> not, where not, was as, that not as fancy. Where was that unit? Well, we went to Lake in Okinawa. Okay. We were in invasion in both places. I went to HR plus two because we had to get in there to attend to the wounded. Was the beach secure when you got in there? <laughs> well, let's put it this way: the the when we were go, leaving, when we left Hawaii to go to Leyte, we were in, in the task force. It didn't seem like there were very many ships there, and I said, "Gee, it can't be much of an operation." Uh, when we pulled into Lingayen Gulf. Uh, all you could see were ships. And, uh, they'd been there for some time softening the beach so they could go in. And of course, when we went in, there were a lot of, a lot of guys laying on the sand and, because uh, they were the initial waves of the... The Marines went in first. Well, the Marines, uh, but the Army, we were in the Army, so we, 
we were in the Army section, and uh, it, it was, we probably saw invasions of, in the source because we were picking up the wounded. Yeah. How did you become a surgical technician? Did you have to get special training for that, Lou? <laughs> I don't know. The other thing is, when you got in the military, uh, they gave you an IQ test, and uh, that's the only thing I figured out that uh, had to something in the IQ test. And, yeah. Uh, surgical technician. Did, did your paths cross with any of the, uh, the, the generals of note? Did you have a chance to, did you, when you were in Okinawa? Oh, I didn't meet any of the generals, no. I just knew of them. How long were you there? Well, we went in the invasion and we were there after and, and actually we were on water going from Okinawa back to Mindoro in the Philippines and they dropped the atomic bomb in the war ended. Well, okay. All while we were en route to the, leaving the Okinawa going back okay. to the So you were you there a couple months or down in Okinawa? When we were on Okinawa, well we were there for the whole campaign. You know, okay. we, were, we were in HR plus two. Uh, in both Lakey and Okinawa. Okay. And, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when we left, uh, when we arrived in Mindoro in the Philippines, uh, coming back from Okinawa, we had to clean up the island. We had to exhume the bodies of the guys who were there in invasion. And uh, then we came home. What was it like coming out? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get any, anybody shooting at you anymore, so it was a great feeling of being able to get home and get released in the service. What was like? A, what was a day like? Like eight hour plus one? Did you get any sleep or did you? Well, when, when you're en route, going to the attack area, they never told you where you were going when you got on that ship. Uh huh. And you didn't know until maybe uh, D Day plus less five. Uh -huh. They told you where you were going. And of course, once they told us we were going to fill things, uh, everybody got very solemn. Yeah, nervous. And, yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, you, you did a lot of praying. And uh -huh. uh, fortunately, you came out of the thing. And I would say the only thing I had gotten when I was in the service was around the case of round worms. Okay. Uh, yeah. What about, what was it, did you get to sleep during the day? Did you? Sleep during the day? You mean, yeah, or at when, night, when did you get to sleep at all? Or was when it, you're in combat? Yeah. Well, you're in the fox over rain and you didn't get yeah. much sleep. Yeah. And of course, you got so tired you would fall asleep. You'd be in the fox with another guy. Yeah. And uh, you'd take turns uh, on and off. Yeah. It's the first thing you did when you got home. When I got home, I was so glad to get home and see my folks uh, and everybody that uh, it was a grand, yeah. grand welcome. Of course, I wasn't home very long and I went back to Ohio State to finish my freshman year. Uh, I had signed a pro football contract when I was on Okinawa. They sent me a contract and see, I had played three freshman games at Ohio State. Paul Brown was the head coach there and he had gone to the military and he had signed to uh, be the, the first coach of the Cleveland Browns. And he invited me to be, well, I think, I think Otto Graham and I were the first two guys he signed. Okay. Uh, and when, when uh, I was discharged uh, from the service, uh, I was discharged in January, and of course I went back to finish my freshman year at Ohio State, and then I graduated in 49, and I started playing pro football in 46. And you were already signed? With the Browns. Yes, yeah, so I graduated. Yeah, I was getting a stipend while I was yeah. in the service. Okay. They were paying me so so many dollars. Yeah. So the, the timing was just right for you. You were at Ohio State. The Browns. This is in the AA Mer All American Conference, right? Yes. And so Paul Brown signs with the uh, Cleveland Browns as the head coach. He knows of you. He, yes. he knows of your capabilities. And you were a kicker at Ohio State, right? Uh, I only played in three freshman games. I didn't play varsity football there. Right? Yeah. So when I, my, my first year, I think uh, it helped me to be a kicker because uh, uh, they, they like those long distance kicks. <laughs> yeah. how, how did it Lou, the toe, Rosa, get started in kicking? It wasn't a very popular thing to do at the time. Well, pro football wasn't a very popular sport in those days either. Yeah. And of course, uh, the success we had and uh, of we got. And, of course, uh, football grew up uh, as the Cleveland Browns were growing up, and 
I think because of the success we had, uh, made more of an attractive uh, uh, attraction uh, to people when they came to see the games. So. Yeah. So, what, like we're back in uh, in Berea, the, would your brothers encourage you to kick? What, what, what excited Blue Rosa decided to do kicking? Well, I grew up in Martin Story, Ohio. Right. I live in Berea after I, started, after I got married okay. in 1950. Uh, Martin Story, I had a brother that kicked, my brother Frank kicked from Martin Story High School, and he learned from my uncle. I'll be there. And uh, with that, I used to go down to the practice field before the season started and retrieve his kicks, and he showed me how to kick a spot on the ball. I said, so I started kicking the ball back to him. And he uh, actually, he would have, my brother Frank would have been a baseball player and the war broken out and he, he was in it for the duration. Uh, and he got married right, right, out of, right out of the service. So I came along and uh, when I was a kid, I used to retrieve his kicks when he was in high school, kicking them back to him. And then when I got into high school, I became a kicker. And I went to Ohio State and I met a guy named Ernie Godfrey. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Ernie Godfrey was an assistant coach at Ohio State. He was our freshman coach. In those days, freshmen couldn't play varsity football. We were a separate unit. And he used to work with me on my kicker. And uh, that was the first coaching that I had uh, outside of the one that my brother gave me. Yeah. When did the nickname Lou the Tell? Well, they, that came in Cleveland. Uh, they uh, were trying to get something to rhyme with Groza. They used to say Lou the Toza Groza. <laughs> they contracted it down to Lou the Tell. So it's stuck and it's, okay. <laughs> it's uh, one that people recognize. And, I had, to, I had to behave myself. And you played tackle also? Yes. See, I went to the Hall of Fame as a tackle. Okay. I played 21 years and 14 of them as, as a tackle and kicker. Sometimes in the last seven, I just kicked. Now, and you're the only NFL player to be all pro in two positions? The one season? Well, they, 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 my ring says uh, off, uh, Hall of Fame tackle. Okay. Is that what you're the most proud of? I mean, if you 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 really you're known as Lou the Toe. Is that as you reflect back on the history of Lou Groza, you want to be known as a tackle or as a as a as a kicker? Well, I in in, in my day, uh, kicking was just part of something that you did, and of course we use this so efficiently that uh, they start hiring guys just to kick, and of course they expand the size of the squad. When they started in '46, they had 33 men on the team. Now I think they got over 40, yeah, so yeah, yeah. there's room in there for just a kick. Yeah, yeah. Discussing, discussing. What was Paul Brown like as a, as a person, as a man? Well, Paul Brown was a fundamentalist. He was well organized. And uh, the big, big thing is you didn't want to get him on your back. Because yeah. <laughs> he could be very caustic. And of course, uh, and so do I. You don't see them get my back and make a better football player. Yeah. But he was, a, he was a great coach, and I think he set the stage for others to emulate him in, the, in a particular profession. Did you uh, mostly know him as a coach, or did you ever know him like as a person? Or spend oh, personal time? Only after I after after retired, yeah. because he, he never wanted to be in a position where he was so friendly as a player that it would become difficult. <laughs> Well, you, you were with the Browns when Paul Brown was let go. What was your reaction to all that? When you heard the word that they could actually let Paul Brown, the legend, go in place of Blanton Collier? Well, actually, I just stayed, tried to stay out of it because it was natural they were trying to get me to make statements that were, were complimentary. Of course, my association with Paul was one of the, all the football I played after I left high school was for him. And if it weren't a good deal for me, uh, I wouldn't have uh, stayed with him at that time. But uh, it was a good deal, and I enjoyed the association relationship. And I just had to be careful. I didn't say anything that was going to rattle the case for Mr. Modell. So uh, I stayed. I tried to stay out of the conflict as much as I could. It was 1950 when you kicked that field goal at the end of the game. Was that, was that one of your highlights? 
Well, it's not a highlight. It's probably a thing we proved that we were able to see we've been the old All American Conference for the four years previous. Mm -hmm. It's our first year in the National Football League, and we showed we could play in the in the pros. You're predicted to lose that game, weren't you? <laughs> yes, but uh, we won, and it was really a glorious feeling. Four years in a row, the Browns remained unconquerable in the All-America Conference, winning four consecutive championships. With the title game of 1949, the league passed out of existence, and the Browns moved into the National Football League, along with two other members of the All-America Conference. Would the Browns continue on top against new opposition? For four years, we read what a lousy league we were in, what lousy teams we were that we couldn't even begin to play against the NFL. They had made so many derogatory comments about our league. Their worst team could beat our best team. So we were emotionally ready to go. We wanted to show them that we had a good football team. Coming in from the All-America Conference, nobody knew how good the players in that league were. Nobody knew whether their four consecutive championships in the All-America Conference were worth anything. Would they beat the Philadelphia Eagles, the reigning NFL champs? And the league scheduled the opening game of the season between those two teams in Philadelphia. Ironic as it may seem, Pro Football's World Series takes place the first week of the 1950 season as the Cleveland Browns, champions of the All-American Conference, take on the defending kingpins of the NFL, the Philadelphia Eagles. 85,000 fans get the thrill in the opening period as Cleveland's Don Phelps is long gone on a 70-yard scamper to the end zone. Phelps' touchdown was nullified by a penalty, but five Cleveland touchdowns stood up. The new kids on the block proved superior to the old guard Eagles in every phase of the game. I can say quite honestly, no sports team in the history of sports, no matter what sport it was, was better prepared emotionally than we were for that game. We were so ready, we were foaming at the mouth almost, we were ready to play that game. And we went in there and, uh, of course, we killed them. Cleveland killed the competition throughout 1950. The best show in football made a smashing NFL debut. The Browns marched to a 10-2 regular season record. Marion Motley, number 76, led the league in rushing. The defense featured future Hall of Famers Bill Willis and Len Ford, number 53. Against the Philadelphia Eagles, Lenny Ford proved his greatness as a rushing lineman as he drove Adrian Burke into the goalpost. The defense registered 55 takeaways and led the league in fewest points allowed. The Browns earned a chance to play for the NFL championship. At Cleveland Stadium, the Browns hosted the high-scoring Los Angeles Rams in a game that still ranks as one of the most exciting in postseason history. Otto Graham threw for four touchdowns and 298 yards and rushed for 99 yards in a back-and-forth battle that saw the lead change hands five times. But despite Cleveland's firepower, the Browns were trailing 28 to 27 with only a little over three minutes left to play. We were one point behind and going down the field in the last quarter with you know, a couple minutes left in the ball game. And I ran a quarterback draw play, hit to the blind side and I fumbled. And uh, I was so discouraged. Here I thought our first year in the NFL, Graham fumbles the football, Graham lost the chance to w beat the Rams. And uh, so I headed up for the sideline. I was afraid to talk to Paul Brown, even look at him. And I tried to avoid him, but I couldn't. And he came over to me and he patted me on the shoulder and said, don't worry, Oz, we're still gonna get him. And I can't tell you how much that meant to me personally. When the Browns got the ball back with 148 remaining, Graham's running and passing brought Cleveland to the Rams 11 yard line. The Rams now led 28 to 27, but the Browns never gave up. With passes like this one from Graham to Rex Bumgardner, the Browns fought back. There were just 28 seconds showing on the clock when Lou Groza attempted a field goal. 
Rosa will attempt a field goal. It'll be 15 yards. He boots the ball. It's up in the air. It's good. It's good. It's good. In their first season in the NFL, the upstart Browns, who had supposedly played in an inferior league, emphatically proved that they belonged and that Paul Brown was a truly visionary head coach. To Paul Brown in the early days and trying to kind of built the team around Otto Graham and, and, and guys like you, the offensive line, was, was that designed to really sort of protect Graham? Well, no, the thing is, you know, you grow into a situation, you do something, you do it well, and then you, you capitalize on it, you expand upon it. And he, uh, uh, in those days, running was, was the predominant part of pro football. And of course, we had Otto Graham who could throw the football and we started using it more uh, and eventually it became about 50% of our executed offense. Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, because of the success we were enjoying, other teams started doing the same thing, you know, trying to get a quarterback that uh, would uh, be capable of having their offense. And of course, like anything else, diversification always creates soundness, and we had a diversified attack. Paul Brown, the man who virtually invented the modern game. Brown was the first to fully utilize coaches in the press box the first to call every play from the sideline. He set the trend emphasizing speed in the long pass and invented the most basic method of protecting the quarterback. He brought in the modern pass blocking concepts and that was very significant because if you look at some of those old systems, they were completing 35% of their passes. Pass blocking schemes were out of whack. They didn't, know, they didn't have a clue. Here comes Paul Brown with the cup system. Uh, he had everybody turning out. And it was so simple that you wonder why nobody thought of it before, but they just didn't. And so he had Graham throwing out of that cup. Marion Motley that just passed away? Was it, who just passed away? Was it Motley or Lavelli? Marion Motley, yes. Yeah. Wait, what do you mean to your offense? Well, let's put it this way. We, we used to call it Motley Trap. Uh, and uh, Mary was a big guy. He was, a, he, he, was uh, one, he was probably the biggest guy on the team at the time. And uh, he was the uh, one-two fast man. He and Ray Renfro used to uh, run for speed. And uh, I saw about three or four guys take a shot at Mary once on a long run. He was going for a touchdown. And uh, he was just that kind of guy. Was not only see in those days, uh, we we were. Uh, we had to use the fullbacks to do some blocking for pass protection because we were running a lot of six-man lines and five-man lines defensively. And uh, Marion was not only a good runner, but he was also a good blocker. And he, uh, he, was, he, was, he was a good one and so very well. He had the number 76 for a while, didn't he? <laughs> That's the way it started uh, in those days in the old All-American Conference. Uh, I was more a 40 member. Okay, 46 was that your number? Yeah, 46? my number was 46. We had Luke Rosa has a question, and Coach Paul has the answer. We had the centers were 20s, guards were 30s, tackles were 40s, ends were 50s. Okay. Uh, quarterbacks, I think Otto's number was 16. I think I can't remember what his number was. 14, I think it was. After. I don't know right, 14 later. But Bobby was 76. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And then you ended up with 76. And no, no, I don't mean it was 60. Yes, he was. When the Browns joined the NFL in 1950, they kept the same uniform numbering system that had been used in the All-America Conference. Backs like Otto Graham and Dub Jones, for example, wore numbers of 60 and higher. The system was different from the way the NFL assigned numbers. To avoid confusion, the NFL streamlined the numbering system in 1952, and new numbers were assigned to the three AAFC teams that had been integrated into the NFL. Backs like Otto Graham now wore numbers lower than 50. Place kicker and offensive tackle Lou Groza wore number 46 as a member of the original Browns. Then he was given number 76 in the revised system. Marion Motley had worn number 76 for six seasons. 
but in 1952, his jersey was emblazoned with the number 36. Sure, so I mean, you're affiliated with 76. So that, when did it automatically change the numbers? The NFL decided to... Yeah, they were consistent in their numbering system. When we joined the league, we had the old numbering system, uh, the All-American Conference, and uh, then they, so everybody would be consistent. But actually, what it did is help the guys who were the announcers. We saw a fellow with some such number do something, and would say, so-and-so did this. Who were some of your favorite teammates? Well, I, I would say they probably all were. You know, I, I, I didn't yeah. try to develop any real tight friendships. And one kind of lasting friendship was with Marion and uh, Dante Lavelli because they lived in Cleveland. Uh, and you'd see them more frequently than yeah. some of the guys who moved out of town. Lou Rimkus and I used to buddy around a lot too when he was with us. Of course, he's deceased now. It's told me you get older, and most of your friends are gone. <laughs> Do you get any sense, Lou, you're, you're playing offensive tackle, I mean, full-time. Did the other players, and they also knew you were a kicker, the other players try to kind of step on your toes, make make life difficult? Yeah, they had a guy in Detroit, I can't think of his name right now. Uh, <laughs> we were in a huddle getting ready for the play, and some guy came and tramped right on my right foot. <laughs> stomped on my right foot, you know, I'm in a huddle, been a, he didn't see him coming, and he ran. His name is Gil Main. He ran back to the line of scrimmage, just laughing. But uh, no, nothing uh, serious ever happened. Came to that. Were you were you were you one of the bigger guys? Just to be interested with on the on the team. I I guess you guess you could say that at, 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 at that particular area of development. But of course now I'd uh, be one of the little guys. Yeah, exactly. And there's that when the linemen would break the huddle, they would all chant, "Nobody touches Graham." Otto Graham did get touched once in a while, so Paul Brown invented the face mask. How much did having a face mask on your helmet change the game for, for you? Oh, it didn't change it at all, but I, uh, I didn't wear it originally uh -huh. uh, until one time I was going down under a kickoff. And just as I was making the tackle, the, the guy cut, and I caught him face on. And I had just that single bar that we used to wear, and that uh -huh. broke and punctured my nose. Okay. And it's a good thing it didn't hit me in the eye, see. Yeah, and it broke my nose. And uh, I continued playing and put on, put on so you a face mask. Nose. They put a face mask on, and of course, then they repaired it after the game. Yeah. Five numbers that have been retired in Cleveland Brown history. 76, you know, being one of them. Do you remember the ceremony at all? Was it was it uh, when they retired your number? Do I remember? It? Yes. Yeah. It's any time you get an honor like that, you know, it's a, it's a recognition thing. And it's always it's always hard to express yourself properly for the for the adulation that goes with it. Do you know the other ones, Aaron Cruz? Let's quick question. Otto Graham would be one. Jim Brown, right? Right. Oh, oh, Ernie Davis, because, I, because of his untimely passing, and Don Fleming. Now, Don, I got to be honest with you, Don, he was a defensive back. Yes. He was electrocuted on the job in the season. He, he had number 46. They retired both your numbers, Liz. 46 and 76. <laughs> Yeah, number 46. Is that what you had at, uh, when you were at the, in the AAFC? 46. 46, yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. Both both your numbers have been retired then. Don was 46. Yeah, that's right. Don was 46. Teaching in the coaching. It was just like going back to school. When I arrived. Then you get inducted into the Hall of Fame. When you went out there, you gave a speech. Yeah, of course. Do you remember much about it? Right away, I uh, starts rushing in, you know, what, what do you really want to say and how you want to say it. And of course, uh, it's, it's quite an honor to be recognized this way. And, uh, you have a lot of appreciation for, for getting that kind of recognition. Who, who, who presented you? Uh, Paul Brown. Paul Brown? Yeah. Now, is that something you select? 
Yes. Yes. Next. Somebody said I should should have liked to have have Modell introduce me. <laughs> what was your relationships to Modell? Well, I got along fine. I, I just didn't get any kind of confrontations. I never, never really did agree with his dismissing of Paul Brown, but uh, I wasn't going to get into that rat race. Yeah. I just stayed away from it, uh, not making any comments on it. Uh, all, all the football I played, I could have high school as well. And, so uh, you learn how to live with people's <laughs> problems they may have in their personalities. <laughs> Did folks inundate you with questions when Modell decided to leave Cleveland? Did they want your reaction? <coughs> no, well, no, uh, they did, but I just stayed away from because I didn't want to. I didn't want to get into that okay. confrontation. I bet you're glad they're coming back. Oh yeah. I'm supposed to ask you this question: Why have they changed the name of the uh, street in Berea from Lovers Lane to Lou Groza Lane? Is there a connection? And does it have to do with I wasn't football? a lover, I was just a football player. <laughs> that's what that, Wayne said. That what you, that's not what you said he would say. That's, <laughs> no, we that, that, that was Dad's question. <laughs> Remember, but Lou Groza, uh, last of the original bronze retired, offensive tackle 47 to 59. Back injury, forced layoff in 1960. Was that during the season? Did, did you get the injury, or was it? Well, it was in preseason. Preseason. Yeah. We were at training camp at that time. Yeah. Where was training camp? We were, we were in Hiram College at that time. Okay. We had various training camps. We had uh, training camp in uh, Bowling Green. And, uh, at Hiram College. Where was training camp? Is compared to what it is now. What was it like for you guys? Well, you know, it was a little more experience. You had to remember, pro football really came into its own uh, from the recognition, recognition standpoint after, after we uh, in Cleveland started having a lot of success. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, before Paul Brown uh, came into the league, uh, coaching was sort of a part time business. So, Everybody go home in the off season, but of course Paul kept his staff on. And we had a lot of success in doing it, and uh, with that, uh, everybody starts emulating him, and uh, uh, I think it changed the whole complexion of pro football. Is the training camp one of his innovations, Paul Brown's, or is that just something that everybody? Well, the, well, the, the training camp wasn't as. Uh, well, I don't say. I would say well organized as, yeah. as it was when uh, Paul came in. He was, he was, he was death on organization and fundamentals. So, did he make sure you came home when you were fed at a certain time and, oh, and yeah. all that stuff? Yeah. Well, not, not after training camp, but yeah. in training camp we had, we could never go anywhere. Yeah. 1950, when we won the championship, it was our first year in National Football League, and we were losing. Our score was 28 to 27 because when we were getting ready to kick an extra point, uh, the, 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 it was fro the field was frozen, the wind was blowing, we were down at the scoreboard into the field, mm -hmm. and the wind caught the ball and the holder couldn't grab it. We missed it. We never tried the extra point. And, what he did is he, he grabbed, when he grabbed the ball, he threw a pass and went through one of our guys' hands in the okay. end zone. Now we're coming down to the closing seconds of the ball game. We're losing 28 to 27. And we got about uh, less than a half minute to play. And I kicked a, about a 16-yard field goal uh, in which we won the championship that year. It was the first year in the National Football League. And that was probably, uh, it wasn't the longest kick, the most difficult, but it was one that had odd hanging on it because it uh, yep. proves that we were capable of being playing in the National Football League. Did anything special happen in the huddle before the kick, or do you remember anything about that? Or? No, see, I dropped back to the tackle position. To the, to, the, to the kicking position, and they put in a two tackle in my place. And I didn't have time to think about it. <laughs> All I did was think of the fundamentals. So I, I broke it down. Every kick I ever started, tried, stance, approach, contact, and follow through. That's all I was thinking about. Is I line my toe up in the spot in the middle of the goalpost and I square my shoulders to the uprights. 
and I tell the homer I'm ready. The ball is snap. I take the first step as it is his, it's his hand. The second step comes down behind the ball. And I watch the spot on the ball. I kick through it. Come down in front. Straight line. That's who you're trying to focus on. That's all I thought about. Every kick that I take that I did that. And then there's a picture of you, I remember, being in the locker room that they took after that game with the, I think the championship trophy and, and Paul Brown is there. Oh, there were a lot of, a lot of pictures taken. In. Yeah. Well, gee, you only had 608 points, Lou. <laughs> Incredible. And you were the leading scorer in the NFL for a long time until, did George Blanda break that record? Yes, George, George Blanda. He played longer. And, yeah, he did. Yeah, I played 21. I don't know what George, I think George played 25 years. Tough for you to go, like in 1960, you, 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 you missed the year because of an injury and then they, you come back and you're just a kicking kicker? I mean, was it not being involved in the, the activity of the game? Did you miss that or is it you were relieved? Well, it, it, you know, all, all my athletic career when I was playing football, because uh, when I was in high school I played three sports. The way it happened is in professional football, uh, they started a new league and that's how, uh, of course, they came with Paul Brown. And, uh, it was, it was just a, just a way of life, you know. You, you, you're playing tackle and you kick, so you only have 33 guys on the team, and they they couldn't carry a guy just to kick. So I was kicking and playing tackle at the same time. Yeah. And the way it ended up, I finished right there just kicking. Was there a time when Lou Groza woke up and said, "I'm done"? You know, he says, "I've had enough of this." No, I uh, always thought I could still go. Even, even, even the, my last year, I thought I could still play. But uh, uh, it didn't work out that way. How did they come to tell you? And did they? How did that happen? Did the coach come? And, I, I don't know about this story. Did you finally, when you retired, did they? Did somebody coach go up to you and say, "Lou, we're, we're doing something different next year"? Or? No. Well, they 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 asked me if I wanted to go to San Francisco to play, and I told them no. Ah. San Francisco wanted me to come out. Okay. It's like you can't play here and finish. Yeah. Of course, they have Don Cockrell who's coming in. He's I see. a young guy, and I, I played 21 years. So we figured they're going to run out of steam here pretty soon. Was that tough to take? Was it tough to cover? Well, every time I played, I always thought I could do the job. Otherwise, I wouldn't be trying. Right. Cleveland lost 62. It was in the mud. And I think it was Blanton Collier's last game. Do you remember that game? I don't remember the games we lost very well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good answer. <laughs> well, I remember. <laughs> and you know what? We're not interviewing you. <laughs> when you got selected to be on a Pro Bowl team, was, was, that, was that a real highlight for Lou Groza, or just did you think it was another game? At that stage, uh, stage of my uh, aging, uh, it was one of the fine recognitions you had because you, you recognized them want to be the better football players in the league. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was always a nice uh, recognition. Of course, uh, when you're being selected to the Hall of Fame, I, I can remember uh, uh, the first year uh, I, I, I didn't make it when I was eligible. And the reason for it is some guy was a young reporter from some newspaper, I can't, they never told me who he was, said that he, 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 that he didn't just think that just a kicker should be able to get the whole thing. Of course, he didn't realize I'd play tackle. Yeah. And, uh, that's how I went in the Hall of Fame as a tackle rather than as a kicker. And I don't know if they have, well, they do have a you know, pure kicker now in Stennerwood. Uh, yeah. Does it bother you at all to see the kickers now? They're all soccer-style kickers? You mean? No, they only pay if the ball goes to the junior uprights. Is there any way to get there? Who were some of the tougher defensive players you played against? <laughs> well, they're, I would say probably the guy that 
tough as would have been Doug Atkins who played with the Bears at the time. Okay. What was tough about him? He was a big man. Well, if you try to cut him, he'd jump over you. <laughs> and he was he was fast enough. He was a hurdler. And, uh, he, he just he, he was fast and quick. And he never, when he lined up defensively, he never wanted to get too close to you when you could attack him. He, he wanted to get a little distance from you. And of course, now you had to try to set up the, on the inside so he doesn't get inside of you. Yeah. With that, he would, uh, he would uh, try to run around outside. He was, he was, a, he was a track guy. Yeah. Big Daddy Lipscomb, what's that mean to you? Well, he's well recognized. Uh, he's one of the top football players that plays in the of course, there are a lot of them, and if you start recognizing all of them, it would be very difficult. You had a guy on your team who was a defensive end, Len Ford. He was a character. Yeah, I used to practice against him. Did you really? And I think because I practiced against him, it made me better, too. Yeah. Because he was alone. <laughs> Now, was was Abe Gibran? He played with you guys also, didn't he? Uh, Abe was the left guard and he played next to me. Now, was he was he as big as you? I mean, you, just, you see him now. I guess I get this vision of Abe Gibran. It's huge, but um, well, I think we were about the same size. Yeah. I was a little taller than he was. I used to tell him I was better looking than him. <laughs> That's an Abe who grows a Boulevard. Abe is, That's right. Abe is, Abe is deceased and he was really an outstanding football player. The rise of the black athlete in modern pro football was originally set in motion back in 1946. The Cleveland Browns featured future Hall of Famers Bill Willis and number 76 Marion Motley. They were the first black athletes to play leading roles in a championship offense. An offense designed by none other than Paul Brown. Were there blacks in the league when you started in with the AAFC? We were really the first team to have any numbers. We had three. We had Horst Gillum, Bill Willis, and Mary Motley. Otto Graham, just as a character, or as a, a moral character. Moral character? Yeah, is he a leader? Yeah, I, Otto has been an officer in the uh, military. He's in the Navy, I believe. And uh, I, I think his I think his record speaks for itself. He was he was an honorable guy and a great football player. Forty six to nineteen fifty five, Brown and Graham led Cleveland to four All America conference titles, and after Cleveland joined the NFL in nineteen fifty, three world championships. Graham was perfect to play the leading role in Brown's system. He was the all American boy, the face on the cereal box. After all, not everybody could play for Paul Brown. In my opening lecture, I always said to him that uh, if you're a bum, a boozer, a chaser, uh, that kind of person I'm not interested in you making our team. This is, this is a real highlight. I'm just so thrilled to have a chance to chat with you. So, thank you. Thank you. Lou Groza kicked a 43-yard field goal to put the Browns ahead.